If not for the calendar, I'm not sure I could tell you how long this war, this madness, this bloodshed has been raging on. For some species it was just a couple of generations, for others, some others lost count. What does it matter now, now that we are closing to an end? It's been so long that we are just approximating. Fifteen hundred years or so, some say less, some say more. I know you all are aware of the situation, how could you not be? For centuries now we have been born under the planetary shields, raised in space academies, and died on forsaken muddy fields in scarred floating orbs we used to call planets. I'm writing this for my crookie, my newest son, whom by the time this message reaches home should already be a grown duskan. Crookie, my son, my pride, my legacy. Know that even if you are the last out of fifteen hatchlings, your father and especially your mother loves you just as much as all the others, heroes or not, alive or not, useful or not. As a last guidance from your mother, I order whoever receives this message to not read it to you. By now you should have learned the galactic standard, and if not... I think you are not ready to hear your mother's last wish, because you are mentally retarded, and am sorry I gave birth to a disappointment, but I would still love you no less, maybe. I'm sure your father has done everything possible not to expose your fragile mind to the horrors that linger just outside our planetary shield. I trained him well, but I'm also certain that he has given you enough information to know the struggle we are under. I will now tell you as briefly as I can. Eons ago, a dispute sparked the flames of conflict between two neighboring empires, the Burbs, an avian species, and the Crocs, a reptile species, I think. It's been so long since their extinction, few remember their names, much less their features. All we bothered to remember was that a border dispute led to the destruction of a mining drone, and then a survey station, and then a reconnaissance craft, and then a star base, and so on. Initially, the conflict followed the rules of war. Both species were known for their honor, good sense, and their exquisite clothing accessories. Grandma still has some footwear, if I remember correctly. It all started spiralling out of control when the Burbs called their relatives to help them, a species known only as the Gubernament Drones and a couple of other allies, to which the Crocs also called in their allies. Together, the Crocs and the allies formed a heinous and disgusting union, feared by many and repulsed by all but the most barbaric and uncivilised people such as the Germans and the Britic. The union of the crocs and the species called sooks was the breaking point. The conflict had to escalate into full-on war, a war the likes of which was never seen in the galaxy. Planets bombed from orbit, meteorites launched at stations, cities destroyed and populations enslaved, stripped of their pride and forced to wear unholy clothes. Seeing this many in the Galactic Alliance wanted to intervene, everyone agreed just now who to support. The Burbs were indeed the perpetrators, but the Crocs and their allies came from systems so arid that they indeed had no drip. After several years the GA was split into two, the majority wanted to come to aid the stupid birds, while a strong minority wanted to save the Crocs. And so it happened. The supporters of the Space Lizards split from the GA and created their own faction the Confederacy of Heat Enjoyers, CHE, while the remainders of the GA reorganized in the first Galactic Empire. No, just kidding, they named themselves the Union of Decency, UD, swearing that they would rather die than be forced to wear what the CHE imposed on the prisoners. Many worlds rumbled at the sound of the horns of war. Fleets were mobilized, armies raised, and industries erected. And with such an escalation of forces, then came an escalation of atrocities. No more orbital bombardments, no more meteorite strikes, no more enslaved populations. Planets glassed, stations vaporized, and civilizations forced into extinction, or worst. When glassing a planet's surface was not an option, then, then even more hideous methods were experimented. 
Reports came of planets devoid of food for centuries until they all starved out, others where the atmosphere changed composition rendering them inhabitable, some saw an extreme rise in temperature which caused massive climate changes. Freenus IV had an extreme cold winter. The UD forced the population to either die of cold or wear fake clothing brands such as Dear God, Abibus, LeBron James, or Noyce. Many choose the ice. For decades, centuries, millennia, the war raged on, seemingly without one side getting the better of the other. Until finally, roughly 100 years ago, the CHE lines finally broke. Outnumbered three to one, it was about time that the heat enjoyers suffered from the staggering difference in numbers. Under your grandfather's command, our fleets rode the interstellar waves and rushed through the nebulas. No formation could match them. No fleet could stop them. They were approaching the edge of the galaxy, pushed away every opposition and crushed every enemy, until they reached the extremity of the third arm of the galaxy's spiral. Here, they thought of going around the CHE fortifications and outflank their fleets. They were mistaken. They reached the territories of an unknown and unassuming race. They called themselves humans. At first, the relationship was quite cordial, amicable, one might say. Sure, they were a new face on the galactic portrait, but they possessed remarkable technologies, and they had really nice outfits for a new species, and for the few systems that were colonized, they possessed a strong network and were prosperous in trading and commerce. When the UD found out they were already in contact with the CHE and were happily trading with them, outraged at such a thing, they demanded they stop trading with their sworn enemies, especially now that the war was coming to an end. The humans reluctantly stopped all commerce and interactions with the lizards and their friends, not wanting to get involved into the war and noticing how they were severely on the back foot. But in an act that the humans would call hubris, the successor of your grandfather, blinded by promises of honor, fame, and street recognition, asked, or more likely demanded to the humans, safe passage for all military crafts through their controlled space in order to attack the CHE from an unexpected direction and end what was now fifteen centuries of unending war. We expected the humans to concede. We expected them to cower, asking for forgiveness. We expected them to do as they were told, just like the first time. They said no. They said no. At first we thought of some way of appeasing them. After all, it was only right to give them a reward or ask for a price for contributing in the war. But after hearing that the CHE also tried to ask for the same rite of passage and were also refuted, the Supreme Admiral of the UD decided to strike them, to let them know what insignificance a mere system and a couple of colonies had in the galactic stage. A grand fleet was massed to smash through their territories and then head directly into the rear of the enemies to deal the fatal blow. Hoping to catch them lacking, he swiftly organized the expedition. Said grand fleet was destroyed. It didn't even make it to the star of the first human system. Another fleet, even grander and more powerful, was summoned, not only to achieve the original goal, but also to teach a lesson by glassing the main planet of those over-evolved apes, whom in his eyes also lacked street cred. The grander grand fleet was also also destroyed, sunk before it could enter human space. Following these setbacks, the UD was shocked to learn that the space monkeys, out of spite, joined the heat enjoyers, but could not send fleets over to other systems, stating that there were not enough to send to help, which was surprisingly true. We found out that the human fleets, despite being unreasonably powerful, were limited in numbers, and so they remained in their little corner of the galaxy. Knowing this, we pushed and bashed against the CHE wall until we finally stuck to it and broke through it. We raised, we pillaged, we destroyed everything that was in our sight. 
Every sea world was a pile of ashes and debris after we left. The atmosphere was so hot, water turned into vapor. Entire species were wiped off the space telephone number registry of the galaxy. An incredible number, though, fled to human space where they were harbored. Not for long, though. Despite ridiculous odds, the human fleets holded the door. The humans, against a combined force of all remaining species of the known galaxy, hold their space for another five years. Entire fleets were lost and rebuilt. Generations were sent home in wooden boxes, some not even in that. This little limb of space, just these thirteen systems under humanity control, is now the tomb of more souls that we would like to admit or are able to count. But despite the unheard-of technologies the humans possessed, such as FTL inhibitors, near-instantaneous warp drive, incredibly efficient engines, all-piercing coil guns, and waterproof footwear, finally humanity collapsed. In a rush of desperation, they built enormous arc ships, which contained not only the remainder of the human population of those meager, war-torn systems, but also all the members of all the allied species they could fit in. They sent them over the border. They sent them in the intergalactic void. They sent them to their doom. We intercepted all those arcs. We destroyed them, all thirty-four of them. Not one reached the lifeless void. Alas, after untold struggles and handed down sacrifices, here we are, in orbit of their fucking home planet. A blue and green ball with a couple of sprouts of yellow. A real shame such a gem was in the hand of a hideous but outstanding race such as that of the humans. What was it called? Uh, I think it was something like dirt. Ah, uh, yes, soil, if the translator doesn't betray me. We are finally here. We boarded the space fortress that held out our forces for far too long, and now we stand, victorious in the command room of what once was a deadly opponent and a feared enemy. All the human planets, colonies, and settlements lay destroyed. Over the intercom, we established communication with the last vessel of humanity and her allies for what matters. A lone disabled ship, three times bigger than our flagship, and five times more powerful and imposing. On her side lies her designation number and her name, ACACL00001, New Horizon. Apparently the humans assign their ships a designation number and grant them a name only after they accomplish noteworthy feats in combat or after special occasions. As I understood, this ship was the oldest, the most powerful, and the flagship of the human fleet. After a minute of buzzing and various interferences, over the screen the face of a human takes shape. He's old white fur on his face and head, tired expression, and a cloth with red stains on his left eye. I am Commodore Lucas Groundrunner, commander of the first Andro- Enough with the talking banana lover. I am here to tell you that your race is doomed. With all the effort you put into the defense of your ball of dirt and rocks, you could have joined our gang and have your race sparred, said arrogantly Admiral Dekid of the cocksuckers race, known universally for being a bitch to deal with. A moment of uncertainty takes the old human before he speaks. No matter the outcome, my people will avenge us. Ha ha! There is no one to left to avenge you. We destroyed all the ships you sent into the unknown. The old man's face pales even more as a result of the news he was presented, knowing that billions of souls have been lost despite his best efforts. Dear God, you will... His voice was interrupted by a sudden explosion that shook his ship. From the station we could see the atmosphere leaking as the hull was breached, a secondary explosion due to the damage. The last thing the human said, with a tear in his eye and a faint smile, still makes me tremble with every thought. Joe will avenge us. Who is Joe? I stuttered, confused. He couldn't properly reply as his ship was engulfed into a ball of fire. So there we were. The last known humans in the galaxy are no more. We won. I ordered the boarding party to set up refreshments and bring out the cake to celebrate our victory. 
While everything was being cleaned and prepared, out of curiosity, I started to look around the various consoles in the command room. I was very interested in the design principles that have given birth to such outstanding warships. After a bit of trying, one of my aides handed me a code. That was it, the code I was looking for all this time to access the database of the station. Excited, I slowly digit the numbers, one, two, three, four, and then I was in. There were a lot of things to discover. First, I took a glimpse at their blueprints. A wall of folders appeared in front of me, not really being my field. I opted to look at their tactics. What I found was mesmerizing. From the most complex and elegant assault formations filled with details and PowerPoint presentations to the one that was labelled as Mordaka, the folder was empty. And there, as I was browsing the various files, I noticed an unread communication. I thought nothing of it at first. A last desperate message to all survivors? There were none. A reckless last assault. No ships were left. An insult left for whoever was to read. Maybe. I opened the folder, and what I found was something that left me speechless. Noticing how I suddenly stopped browsing, Dickid walked up to me, looking at the screen. He, as well, was shocked. I, I, is that porn? he said, looking at the second screen where a hendai male was browsing before he left for the bathroom. No, you fucking idiot! Look at my screen! Andromeda Command. This is Canis Major Command. Request received and relayed to Milky Way High Command. MWHC has deployed following units per your request. More units are being assembled, including the 7th and 10th Grand Fleet. 3rd Grand Fleet, 11th Battle Group, 12th Battle Group, 13th Battle Group, 14th Battle Group, 15th Battle Group, Heavy Cruiser Squadron 31, 40 Cruiser Squadron 31, 40 Light Cruiser Squadron 151, 200 Fleet Carrier Group 11, 15 Light Carrier Group 46, 60. Click to see plus 34, 67th Fleet click to show plus 24, 68th Fleet click to show plus 25, 70th Fleet click to show plus 22, 73 the Fleet click to show plus 25, 114th Auxiliary Fleet click to show plus 30, 115th Auxiliary Fleet click to show plus 31. Escort Fleet 53, 58 click to show plus 345, click to show plus 69 units. ETA to soil, one terra day after message received, 23 H ago, remember Crookie, Mama loves you.